So today we're going to go over crown, print, uh, crown preparation principles. Okay. So how do we grind this tooth down? What are we looking at in terms of parameters, and what's the sequence in which we should probably do this in? Okay. So crown prep. How much, so some, these are some of the questions that we had kind of posed in the last lecture, right? Some of the things that you need to learn as you walk out today. So how much do we need to reduce this tooth? Well, what shapes should the junction of the tooth and crown look like? So where should the junction end or that crown margin end? And how parallel should the walls be? Okay. So the theory is we're just going to grind this tooth circumferentially and a little bit on top. And here's sort of a summary slide. We'll jump jump back into sort of the details of this, but these are just some of the measurements that we're going to be looking for when you prepare the tooth. Okay? So PFM, porcelain fused metal, this is also known um, as a metal ceramic crown. You'll see that in some of your textbook. Okay? But the idea is that you have metal underneath and then porcelain on top. All right, again, we'll go over the parameters um, and our grade, grading criteria um, when you guys prep. But I want to give you just a quick outline before we jump into the details about how this works. Okay, so we're just going to go through sequentially and go through all the steps. First step is you want to reduce the central groove. Okay, so you'll take a burr and make a little groove right in the middle. So this is important because your opposing cusp, your maxillary cusp, is going to hit right in that central groove. So you want to make sure you have enough thickness of material there. Okay? And then you want to uniformly take down your buckle cusp. So you're going to take a burr and orient it sideways and then drop it. You notice how it follows the angle of the cusp. So we'll drop that down. Okay? And we'll do the same thing on the lingual. We're going to drop that down. Okay, so on the occlusal surface, now you have reduced evenly um, um, your buccal lingual cusp. On the buccal cusp, pay attention to the contour of your buccal cusp there. If you were to look at it, you would notice that it requires a second sort of bevel there. And we call that a functional cusp bevel. Okay, so you're going to come at about a 45 degree angle to reduce that part. And then you're going to go in between the teeth. So this view is from the uh, mesial. You can't really see the interproximal reduction until we turn it kind of sideways, which we'll show you in a different slide here. Okay? So you're going to go through interproximally and reduce that tooth structure. Then you're going to jump to your buckle margin. And we want to put a 1.2 millimeter shoulder margin, so a 90 degree margin, on that buckle surface. And then on the lingual, we're going to be a little bit more conservative, and we'll explain why in a bit. So you're only going to put a half millimeter, and instead of a shoulder, it's going to be a curved margin. We're going to call that a chamfer margin. Okay? All right. And then you notice towards the occlusal kind of one third, it kind of leans in just a little bit, not as much as on the buckle. So we're going to kind of reduce that. And that's what we call our secondary plane of reduction. So that's sort of the general outline of the prep. And you see all the sharp angles and points. We're going to refine those and smooth those out. We don't want anything sharp in our preparation. So at the end of the day, that's sort of what a crown prep should look like. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? Should we dive into the details now? All right. So central groove reduction, right? So this is performed with either a 330 carbide or a diamond. And based on your um, operative class, we know that the carbide is about a millimeter and a half in length, and the diamond is about two millimeters. So pick and choose your weapon of choice. If you're using the diamond, don't go the full depth. You want to go three-fourths of the depth. Because again, we're trying to get a millimeter and a half uniform re reduction on the occlusal surface. So we're going to place that into the central groove. And you're going to extend that out into the marginal ridge and go as far out as you like, just don't hit the neighboring tooth. Okay? So this establishes sort of a trough right in the middle of the tooth. Right? So that's going to be a helpful guide for us as we reduce the remaining tooth structure. All right, then we have our, that's our central groove reduction. Then we're going to jump to our occlusal depth grooves. So we're going to start in the buckle. So it's helpful to establish these orientation or depth grooves 
to start a reduction. Because you can imagine if we just started reducing off the top, pretty soon we lose reference of where we started from. right? So if you place your depth grooves, you can see the depth in which you want your uh, reduction to end up, but you still have enough of your kind of original tooth surface to kind of gauge and measure whether your depth grooves were appropriately placed or if you have enough reduction. Okay? So these are little guides. So we're going to take our um, 6847KR burr. So if you, here, one, why doesn't everybody take up, uh, open up your uh, fixed manual? So in the beginning chapters here, let's see where it's at. There's a section on burrs. So, yeah, maybe that way. Okay, page 13, 14. All right, so this is a list of all the burrs that we have in our burr block, okay? And there's a numbering system that we kind of use, right? So if you pay attention to the first number, you'll see that it starts with a six, and it's highlighted green. So you're going to find a green stripe on that burr. So if you look on page 13, a green corresponds with a coarse burr, okay? So it's a grit size of 125 microns. Okay, and then in the number column, it's six, okay? So the first number there designates the grit or the coarseness of the burr. The remaining parts after that, the 847KR, signifies the shape of the burr. So the KR burr is a shoulder, okay? So you're gonna get a 90 degree, more or less, uh, junction there. And then the 018, that stands for how wide the uh, burr is at its shank. So if you look at the lecture there, it's 1.8 millimeters, and that corresponds with the 018. And for these burrs, as you, the tapered ones, as you go down towards the tip, it always converges to 0.6 millimeters less than what the original width was at the shank. So in this case, it's 1.2 millimeters at its tip, which is perfect for us because we want our buckle uh, margin to be 1.2 millimeters, okay? And if you think about right dead center in that burr, that would be about a millimeter and a half, right? So you can use this burr as sort of a gauge as you reduce. You want to sink that burr so that it is reduced about a millimeter and a half. Um, so that's how these burrs kind of work, and we'll walk through some of the other shapes um, as we get to them, right? So this is your 6847KR, and again, the 018 stands for how wide the burr is, and it's always 0.6 millimeters less um, when you get to the tip, all right? So the goal of this uh, reduction is to take your tip and sink that into the bottom of your central groove reduction that you had established at 1.5 millimeters. And you want to maintain the angle of the burr so that it is uniformly reduced, meaning that the inclination of that cusp tip should be reflected by the angle in which you hold your burr. Okay? So where do you put your cusp tips? Well, I like to think of this as sort of a mountain range, and you have peaks and valleys, right? You have your cusp heights, your cusp tips, and then you have your developmental grooves. So if you were to draw sort of where the grooves naturally lie on the buckle, you'd find them in those locations. So usually I'll make three cuts in those three grooves there and drop that down the width of the burr, okay? So that's what we're doing there. Notice the angulation of the burr. We're gonna kind of harp on this point over and over again. Okay, that gets reduced. And guess what? You're gonna repeat the same thing on the lingual surface. So you're going to find those grooves. And where do you want to put those grooves? Well, generally in these areas. So just in between the two cusps and also on the sides. So if you go a little bit towards the mesial and distal, you'll find a little developmental groove um, just off to the side of the cusp heights, okay, or the inclinations there. All right, so we have our lingual reduction. All right, so the steps after putting our depth grooves is now to reduce or connect the grooves there. 
So you're going to complete the buckle cusp reduction. And you do that by starting the burr in the groove. And then as you come and start to connect the grooves, you don't want to come straight across, right? If you come straight across, if you took your burr and you just went zip, what's going to happen to that cusp tip? It's going to be over or under reduced? Probably over reduced. You've taken off more tooth structure than you need it. Remember, the original contour kind of comes up and then down. So as you reduce, when you start here, you want to go in a little bit of an upward direction. And as you come down, you want to come, or if you're starting here and you connect it, you want to go up. If you're starting from here, you want to bring that down, OK? So the idea is that whatever the contour of that cusp tip looked like prior to prepping, as you reduce it, it should follow that same contour. So you see almost this V shape here, OK? I don't want to see any flat cusp tips coming straight across. All right? Clear on that? We're going to do the same thing on the lingual, okay? Using the same coarse diamond burr. Now we're going to get into this idea of the functional cusp bevel, okay? So you can also put depth grooves here, like you see, and then you're going to connect those depth grooves on the functional cusp. So for tooth number 30, it's going to be on our buckle. Pay attention to what arch you're working on, because when we jump to the top, Guess where your functional cusp is on tooth number 14? The buckle or the lingual? The lingual, OK? So I don't want to see any functional cusp bevels on your buckle surfaces of tooth number 14. So here's your functional cusp bevel, going to be at a 45 degree angle. So here's a good diagram of sort of what we're trying to get at. So you see this angulation here? This should mimic the angle of the opposing cusp tip here. So this line more or less follows this line here. So if you've done everything correctly and you come at an angle, if the junction between your functional cusp bevel and then your original buckle reduction, you're going to end up forming a peak, right? The apex here. That apex, if you were to draw a line from the adjacent tooth's functional cusp to functional cusp, that should be in line with where you have ended your functional cusp bevel. Okay, so that's a good reference for us to use to see if we've done that appropriately. Question? Yeah, yeah. So that's not a great diagram of it there. It's probably a little underused. But if we go back to our original kind of criteria, we're going to see that our um, whole occlusal surface and even our axial wall in that area should be reduced um, a millimeter and a half. Okay, so a millimeter and a half, and then from here to here should be about a millimeter and a half as well. Okay? Right, so when I sink that functional cusp of, so I'll put grooves in there. So this is probably the best picture of it here, and maybe not the best angle of it. But um, I've leaned in grooves. So I'm sinking the depth of the burr uh, when viewed from this kind of orientation. Okay, Because remember, at the middle here is about a millimeter and a half. And sometimes I'll go just shy of that, because I know later on I'm going to refine the prep and end up removing a little bit more. So if you can imagine you know, 1.2 or 1.3, you're probably OK. You're going to end up finishing and refining that a little bit down the road. Okay. Right, so that's your functional cusp uh, reduction. Here's your grooves, and then you end up connecting the grooves. All right, then we're going to go through with our interproximal reduction. Okay, so in this case, we're going to use a eight five six burr. And notice how there's no number in front of that three digit code. So if you go back to your burr block or your burr page on chapter thir page thirteen, we'll find that the medium grit has no number. Okay, so if you don't see a stripe nor a number on that, that means it's sort of considered a medium grit. But notice the width of the burr at its um, shank. It's 1.2 millimeters, which means the tip is going to be real narrow at 0.6. So we've given you a much skinnier burr to cut through the interproximal regions here. 
And we do that for a couple reasons. We don't want you to overreduce that area, and we don't want you to nick the adjacent tooth. So the tendency with a big fat burr is to, you know, if you lean it one way or another, it may hit the neighboring tooth, or you may lean it too much and reduce too much in that area. So we start you off with a skinny burr to uh, break the contact. And then you can notice here we leave a, a thin sliver of tooth structure here, right? So use that as a visual aid as you're going through your contact. As long as you see a thin little piece of tooth that, from the tooth that you're preparing, you know you're not hitting the neighboring tooth, right? So just kind of focus your eyes on there. Don't look at the margin, because we're going to clean that up later, OK? Focus on that interproximal region, the area closest to that neighboring tooth. So generally, it's going to be at that height of contour or where the contact point is. Okay, Just stare at that as you go through. Okay, So you're going to blast through the interproximals. Okay, You're going to come from the side and reduce that area there. All right, so now we're going to go back to our 6847KR burr. And now we're going to put in our buckle reductions. Okay? So you're going to orient this burr so it's along the long axis of the tooth. As you reduce this tooth, sometimes you kind of get lost because, well, we don't know if this is real parallel to that. Um, the tooth just looks kind of funny. So you can always look at the adjacent tooth as sort of a reference and kind of reorient yourself and see if I'm uh, upright, not only in a buccal or mesial distal direction, but also in a buccal lingual direction. Okay? So you're going to want to look at this at differing uh, points. And again, you can put in depth grooves if you want to help establish your uh, 1.2 millimeter margin. Okay? So remember the width here is 1.2, so if you sink the depth of the burr into that tooth, then you know you're at a correct orient uh, reduction. Okay? Um, you can use the burr as sort of a measuring tool to see if you are reduced or not. So you see that little bit hanging off the side of the tooth? That means we're a little bit under-reduced, okay? Uh, so that's our buckle orientation or our buckle uh, reduction. So, um, so these orientation grooves are helpful, um, but they're not completely necessary in the sense that since we could always see where our margin is, you never kind of lose sight of your reduction, as opposed to your occlusal reduction, where once you shave off a little bit of the uh, occlusal surface, you don't have a great reference point of where you started. But here, if you just went through and just kind of took your burr and went side to side, you can always look at your margin here and measure if you're at 1.2. Okay? So for some of us, it's going to be easier for us to skip that orientation groove because sometimes we get this little wavy kind of margin here, or wavy contour as we try to connect the grooves smoothly. Right? So after you do a few, you'll probably figure out um, what is the most helpful to you. So buckle reduction. And then we're going to switch to the um, 6, 8, so the course. And then the 685, uh, this is a chamfer or a curved end burr, and we're going to do that on the lingual. So the lingual is much more um, shallow compared to your buccal margin. One area to point out is these line angles here, like I've shown, is an area that is most commonly under-reduced. So we do a great job on the straight facial, straight lingual, and we just kind of zip our way along. But whenever we turn this corner, we always tend to be a little bit under-reduced, so pay attention to these line angles, okay? Uh, it's just the way we s we're sitting and kind of viewing the tooth. It's harder to gauge whether your uh, burr tip is um, kind of establishing the width that we want. Okay, so our lingual margin. And again, we're going to, as we come up to these, this occlusal third, we're going to tip our burr just a little bit to reflect this little... Um, curvature that we find on the lingual aspect. And it's definitely not as pronounced as on the buccal aspect. Okay? So there we have an outline of our preparation. So from here on out, we're really just going to refine you know, and smooth out um, 
are prepped, and we're going to keep the same contours. So whatever orientation you held your burr in, you want to hold it in the same one, just with a different grit of burr. So here, these are the two main types of burrs that we're using in this crown preparation. And instead of the six, we have an eight in front of it, which means it's a fine diamond. Okay? So you could really slow down your hand piece so you have much better tactile control over um, what you're grinding. Okay? And um, we don't want any sharp points. So why do you think sharp points are sort of detrimental or not good for our crown preparation? Okay, so they become areas of sort of stress concentration. So that's going to be extremely critical when we're doing all ceramic crowns. But when we're talking about any metal crown or metal base, like a PFM which has a metal coping, you generally don't see as many, you know, I've never seen a metal crown fracture before. You'll see them wear, you'll see them have decay underneath. Um, but primarily the sharp points make it challenging for us to do our lab procedures down the road. So think about our impression material, right? Is it easier to capture an impression bubble free if the tooth is, comes to a sharp point or something a little bit more rounded? Probably something a little bit more rounded because that material can flow a little bit easier. Whereas if you have a real sharp corner, it's hard for that impression material sometimes to really capture that without trapping a bubble. So let's say you make a perfect impression. Well, what happens after you make your impression? What's the next step? If you're the lab, or if you're making your own crown, your, your, own, your, your, own, your own lab tech, what do you have to do? You have to pour that into some sort of stone, right? So imagine stone flowing into this impression, and you have a real sharp area. Well, that's another opportunity for a bubble to be entrapped. So it's much easier for the gypsum or the stone to flow into somewhere that's a little bit rounded. Okay? Right? So let's say you did that perfectly, though. Now you have this stone die right, that has a real sharp point. So what do we know about gypsum? So we classify it 1 through 5. right? Remember our dental materials class? OK, so by what physical property is gypsum classified by? Impressive strength, right? So we learned that for our crown and bridge um, procedures, we're going to pour this into a type 4 stone. So it's pretty hard, but imagine a real sharp point. Well, how fragile is that little sharp point at the very tip? It's very easy for that to get abraded. And think about all the procedures we're going to be doing on this, right? We have to trim the dye. We got to paint the dye spacer, lubricate, fabricate the coping. It's got to come on and off to wax it up. So all these things that we're, as we're handling the dye, if you abrade away some of that tooth structure, Right, since it's so skinny and thin at the top, it may alter the contour of our dye. Okay? So for those reasons, it's not great to have any sharp, sharp angles. And it's to help make our laboratory procedures a little bit easier. And specifically for ceramic crowns, those become areas of stress concentration, which can induce fracture. Okay? So oftentimes, the junction between your interproximal reduction and then your um, occlusal reduction, this little kind of point here, um, this becomes an area that you have to smooth out to mimic the contour of a marginal ridge. Right? So smooth or refine the preparation. Um, so this is found in your chapter manual. And this just goes over our ideal reduction. And again, this is a porcelain fused metal crown. So in our functional cusp, we're going to reduce that a millimeter and a half. And then our central groove, again, a millimeter and a half. Non-functional cusp, a millimeter and a half. And then our axial reduction, so in this direction here, so this is our axial wall. So if we take a look at the original tooth contour, this direction here, that should be a millimeter and a half on the buckle. Because remember, we got to make room so what goes into a PFM crown? There's a metal coping underneath. What's the first layer that we put on that? The first layer that you put onto your metal coping is your opaque layer. And why do we need that? So that we can block out the color of the metal. Then you're going to layer on your dentin and then enamel layers subsequently.
So it requires multiple layers of firings or baking the porcelain. Because remember, it, we have that powder and liquid, we mix it up, right, and we stack it onto that metal coping, and then we place it into the oven for it to vitrify, okay? All right, so we need more reduction on the uh, facial for that reason, and we want it to be flat. Whereas in the lingual, we're actually gonna keep this area here in metal, so that's why we can be a little bit thinner on this axial wall and towards the margin. But our occlusal surface is gonna be in porcelain, so we still need that non-functional cusp to be a millimeter and a half. Okay, so if we weren't clear, these are just some of the reductions that we have uh, in a different diagram. So 1.2, 1.5, 1.5, so on and so forth, okay? All right, so let's talk about sort of preparation and we're gonna have three different kind of factors that we look at for a optimal kind of preparation. One is sort of the biology. Right, so we're still prepping a tooth that has a nerve in it. So we'll talk about, you know, we want to minimize the trauma to the nerve, okay? It's got to have some mechanical requirements in the sense that, well, we want that crown to stay on. So how can we design the preparation such that that crown will be kind of adhered to on the tooth, okay, without it popping off? And obviously we want that crown to look as natural as we can, so we want an aesthetic uh, result, which comes into play with the amount of reduction that we need for a PFM crown, is if we under prepare it, what do you think it's going to look like? It's probably going to look a little more opaque because we don't have enough room for the enamel and dentin layers to kind of cover up the opaqueness of that opaque layer. Okay. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about when it comes to biology is sort of this idea that every tooth has a nerve, right? And as people age, that nerve starts to kind of um, recede a bit. So as we're prepping, the goal here when you get to your clinical experience and prep on teeth, we want you to get to a point where you're pretty efficient with your preparations, okay? So the ideal thing is to take your biggest, fattest, coarsest burr and then grind that down as fast as you can. So you want to get about 90% of your prep kind of done very quickly. Then the remaining time you spend is with your finer grit burrs to kind of smooth out the preparation, okay? So we wanted each stroke that you use to be efficient. Because one thing we're trying to do is, one, get the proper reduction, but two, minimize the insult to the tooth, right? What we see a lot of times in the clinic is, okay, we take this kind of you know, coarse-ish or maybe a smoother burr and we're just real conservative and we'll, you know, we're afraid to take too much off. So you're going to dibble dab with it. And pretty soon you're two hours into this preparation we look at it and you're only halfway reduced. And we say, oh, you're only at a, you know, 0.7 millimeter occlusal reduction. You've got to like go twice as much, okay? So now you spend another hour getting down to where you actually need to get to, right? So all this time, every time you're taking a burr to this tooth, what do you think it's doing to that nerve? providing some sort of aggravating or in, insulting it. And eventually, if you do that enough, that nerve will actually die out, right? So uh, about 5% of all teeth that you just prepare for a crown end up in some sort of root canal just for the basis of you touching it, okay? So whenever we treat and plan crowns, we always kind of tell the patient, you know, especially if there's a cavity that has kind of encroached close to the pulp, hey, you may need a root canal on this tooth down the road. So that can be a common occurrence that we see, okay? So that's the biology aspect. One, well, so we're balancing a couple things. One, we gotta reduce the tooth enough so that we can get our crown fabricated with sufficient strength and aesthetic requirement. But at the same time, on the other end, we don't wanna do too much, otherwise you may damage the tooth or the nerve. Um, if a tooth needs a root canal, then that helps solve some of that problem because you're not as worried about damaging the nerve because the nerve is already dead, okay? Uh, but again, you don't want to overreduce because then you lose some of the structural integrity of that tooth. So the more the natural tooth that you have left, the better, okay? All right, so that's what that slide just kind of designates is that, okay, you have differing teeth and then the burr contact and how long there's, there have different groups of, uh, uh, um, 
burrs with water or not water. So again, when you're prepping, you want copious amount of water when you're grinding that tooth, especially when you're in your beginning steps of using your coarse burr. So we're going to answer this question, what should the uh, shape of the margin look like? So we have a buckle margin and then a lingual margin, right? So this is how we're going to separate it. One we call it a shoulder, the other is a chamfer. Okay, a chamfer is rounded where a shoulder is flat. So in the lingual, we want a 0.5 millimeter chamfer. Remember, our 856 burr, the 016, that has a one millimeter width. Okay, so not the real skinny one that we use to break interproximal contact, but the, there's another one that we have that's the same shape that's a millimeter at its tip. So if you use just half of that burr, guess what that margin width is there? Half a millimeter. And it's gonna take on that rounded chamfer shape, right? So that's why we've chosen this burr to establish our lingual margin. And our shoulder burr, we're going to use the full depth of it, and that's 1.2 at its tip. Okay? So it's just a definition of a chamfer finish line or a chamfer margin. So it's a finish line designed for tooth preparation in which the gingival aspect meets the external axle wall at an obtuse angle. Sorry, that's, yeah, that's for the chamfer. Um, okay, so let's talk about the chamfer, why we're using a chamfer on the lingual. So on the lingual aspect of your crown, we're okay ending that junction or that margin. So where the margin or where the crown meets the tooth, that junction is okay to be in metal because it's in an area that nobody can see. It's on the lingual aspect, right? So unless you're digging in there with a mouth mirror or they're like tip way back and laughing real big, you generally can't see the lingual aspects of your teeth, okay? So it's not an aesthetic zone, right? So thus, we're okay using metal. And because we're okay using metal, we can get the metal much thinner in that area than we would with porcelain, right? So metal is a stronger material. It's not gonna fracture on us. So because it's non-aesthetic, we're allowed to use metal. And since metal is stronger, we can be more conservative. And conservative is good because we preserve tooth structure, right? We're not grinding away as much of that natural tooth. So that's the idea of the metal margin on the lingual. And the process of sealing that margin or getting the crown sealed, so if you were to compare the two different ways to form that margin, right, that metal margin is being casted through our lost wax technique, right? So we've waxed it up to a certain contour, invested it, and then we sling metal into that same shape. Whereas the porcelain, Remember the video we showed how they stack the porcelain there and they have to bake it in the oven? If you were to compare the two junctions and how well it seals the tooth, the casted metal tends to do better. Okay? So you get a better marginal seal, less of a micro gap in that area with a metal margin. All right, then we're going to jump to our shoulder. So this is a finished line designed for tooth preparation in which the gingival floor meets the axial, or the external axial wall at approximately a right angle. Okay? So if you remember from our dental materials lecture, we know that porcelain is strongest when it is under compression, but it is weak when it's under tension. So compression meaning if we just take that porcelain and push it against a flat surface, it's going to be relatively strong there. Okay. So because of that, we want a nice flat area for that porcelain to sit on. Okay. So therefore, it is important to prepare a flat, smooth margin for porcelain to compress against in order to prevent fracture. The porcelain margin needs at least 1.2 millimeters of reduction because, again, we need space for what? Metal, the opaque layer, and then dental enamel layers of porcelain. Okay. So we've got to be more aggressive there for the sake of aesthetics and strength. So here's a little summary slide. So uh, chamfers are obtuse angles, right? Rounded. It's usually for it's ideally for metal margins, and then we want to keep that at 0.5. Whereas the shoulder margin, we want at 90 degrees. For porcelain, and we want to be about 1.2 millimeters. 
once again, there's the shape of our margin. And these are the burrs that we're going to be using. So remember, the first um, number is just the coarseness. So you're going to use the, um, this is, the 8 is the fine, 6 would be the coarse. Okay. So 8, 5, 6, 0, 1, 6. Remember, the last three numbers designate the width of the burr at its shank. And it always decreases to um, 0.6 millimeters less at the tip. But since we're only using half of the width of the burr for the chamfer, that leaves us with a half millimeter margin. Okay. So here's an example of what a crown would look like from the inside. And you notice on the facial surface, this is made out of porcelain. So this area here is porcelain. And then here is metal. Okay. So that's how the crown looks like. Um, the coping is all metal, obviously, and then porcelain is stacked on top. So this is a view from the underside of the crown. All right, so just to summarize why we want a chamfer, uh, metal can be used in non-aesthetic areas. The chamfer is more conservative. The metal is stronger. You get a better marginal seal with metal. Porcelain is strongest under compression. The porcelain needs more reduction to hide the metal and, in a sense, the opaque layer as well. Okay. All right, so we'll dive into this a little bit more tomorrow, but one of the questions we want to answer is, well, where should the margin end, right? So we have three differing, uh, we have three terms that we use to describe the margin placement. One is super gingival, which just means above the gum. Equa gingival is that it's right at the gum line, and sub gingival is below the gum line, okay? So um, maybe let's just think, well, what's an advantage of a super gingival margin? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Somebody said it was easier to clean, yeah. You can see the junction there. You know exactly where the tooth meets. Okay, what else? More biologic width. Okay, we'll get into that in a subsequent lecture. But your biologic width in your supra and equigingival, and even your sub, um, can be the same for all three. The only time that we run into violation of biologic width is if your subgingival margin goes below your sulcus step. Okay, so we'll get into that in a bit. What else? How about your impression making? Super gingival is easier because the gums aren't in the way, right? Okay. What's the disadvantage of super gingival? Aesthetics. You can see the transition between the crown and then the tooth, right? So let's say you're using, what if you're doing a metal crown and a full gold crown? Well, who cares about the aesthetics, right? Because it's already a gold crown. So you've already lost that battle, right? So you may as well make your life a little easier, make it more cleansable, easier to make an impression, because um, you know, it's already not tooth color, so who cares, right? Equigingival, so you want to at the gum line, right? So it's sort of right in between, you know, it has some advantages of the supra, some of the advantages of subgingival, where you can kind of hide your margin, but you don't want that margin to recede any, otherwise it'll be exposed. Um, somewhat easier to clean than a subgingival margin, right? But not as easy as a supra. How about for a subgingival margin? Sometimes we're forced into placing a subgingival margin because the decay has gone below the gum line. So we obviously want to remove that decay tooth structure so that the crown has something solid for it to sit on. Okay, so sometimes we're chasing the caries below the gum line. And at some point, if the caries goes too far below the gum line, right, and that's where we get into the biologic width um, term. So again, we'll jump into that later. But you may get so deep where it's not a good idea to place a crown on that as is. We're going to have to modify that in some way. Okay? But the subgenital margin is best to kind of hide any junction that you have. Okay? Um, but it's not as ideal because it's harder to make impression because you've got to push the tissue out of the way. And it's harder to clean. And it's harder to check to see if everything's sealed or if decay has you know, sprung up later on. Because sometimes we'll get recurrent decay underneath the crown. Okay, For our purposes in the Sim Clinic, our ideal is to keep you half a millimeter above the free gingival margin. Okay, So this is to protect our gingival margin from being nicked by your burrs. Okay? In the clinic, the margin placement will be based on your clinical situation. So you'll work with your clinical instructors to determine what, where you should end your margin. 
All right, so let's get into some of these terms. So this is the mechanical properties that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about retention form. So think of retention form as, well, here's the definition. That quality inherent in, dental, in a dental prosthesis acting to resist the forces of dislodgement parallel to the path of placement. So in other words, how hard or how difficult it is to pull the crown off along the path of placement. Okay. So parallel to the long axis or parallel to the um, path of placement. This is assuming that you've prepped the crown along the long axis of the tooth. Right? And if we're to compare that to another term, okay, so here's the diagram. Right? So when you pull straight up, how well does that resist dislodgement? Okay. We're going to contrast that a bit with resistance form which is the feature of a tooth preparation that enhances the stability of a restoration and resists dislodgement along an axis other than the path of placement. So you can think of this as any tipping or rotating force. Basically, instead of pulling it straight down, you're trying to roll that crown off. So if you take your finger and, let's say, push on the buccal cusp, will that crown roll off your preparation? Or, does, so if a crown has good resistance form, the walls of your prep will prevent that crown from rotating off. Okay? Know the difference between retention versus resistance form. So some of the uh, contributing factors, they overlap, but there's a distinct difference in the definition. Okay? Because we're going to ask the question, well, what factors influence the retention and resistance form? And what I'm saying here is that the factors that influence one will probably also affect the other. Okay? And the first concept that we're going to talk about is total occlusal convergence. Another way, another way to, um, that this term is used is what we call taper. Okay? So it's the angle measured in degrees formed between opposing axial walls when a tooth or teeth are prepared for crowns or fixed dental prostheses. Fancy word for bridges. So crowns or bridges. Okay. So if we were to look at this crown prep, right, and if we were to, so these lines designate the path of insertion. Okay. This one happens to be, you know, somewhat ideally prepped, so it's along the long axis of the tooth. And let's pretend we're able to put a protractor there and just measure the angle of that prep in relation to the path of insertion. So let's say we get 8 and 10. So our total occlusal convergence, or taper, is going to be 18 degrees. Okay. So we want our crown prep to be more narrow at the top than it is at the base. Okay. So the reason for that is, well, we need to be able to, remember after we make our um, impression, we're going to pour it in stone, and we're going to do our wax up procedure, right? What do we do after the crown has been waxed up and checked for all the appropriate contacts? We have to invest it, right? Well, how do you, you need at some point then take off the wax from the dye so that you can invest it. And when I say dye, D-I-E, remember that just means the stone replica of your tooth, okay? So, right, you add wax to the dye and eventually that dye needs to come off. So you need those walls to lean in a bit Otherwise, you won't be able to lift your crown off. Okay. All right, so this is also referred to as taper. And the best way to examine taper is to look at the crown prep straight down the long axis. Okay. And to also close one eye so you can really see and try to uh, see the walls of your preparation, your axial walls. Sometimes when we're looking at uh, work on certain teeth, you won't be able to get direct vision. So if you can't use direct vision, well, this is where indirect vision helps. So you've got to angle the mirror in such a way that you can visualize the tooth down the long axis. Okay. So for tooth number 30, that's going to be critical to use indirect vision to sight down exactly down the long axis of the tooth or the path of placement. This will help determine your taper. Okay, so um, what helps us establish the taper is actually the natural contour of the burr. Okay, so we know the burr is wider at the top as the bottom, so it has a natural taper to it. 
So I've gone through and done the math for you. I was a little bored last night. Okay. So you'll notice there's a 0.3 millimeter difference towards the tip in each direction. Right? So you've got to take the inverse tangent of this. Right? So the shank of the burr, the cutting part is 8 millimeters. And then the uh, difference at the tip is 0.3 on each side. So thus, remember your trigonometry? Your angle is going to be inverse tangent 0.3 over 8, 2.14 degrees. Okay? All right. So, which means that our burr is naturally tapered at 2, two degrees. Okay. So for, um, to kind of visualize this, if you were to move um, your minute hand or your second hand or whatever, one minute, let's say, to um, advance from noon, that is a five and a half degree taper. Okay. So that's sort of a visual to see about how much two degrees is. Well, it's half of what a minute hand would be when it's placed at one minute. Okay. So that's pretty steep. So for our sim clinic purposes, what we're going to shoot for is a 10 degree occlusal taper. Total occlusal convergence. So five degrees on each side, but we're going to try to achieve 10. Okay. Clinically, most people were able to prep between 10 and 20. Okay. In your textbook, we advocated for six degrees of taper, which we found is almost nearly impossible to prep without putting any undercuts in. And we'll talk about undercuts in a bit. So we're going to give you a goal of about 10 degree occlusal taper. In reality, when you work in a patient's mouth, it's always going to be obviously harder than it is in a typodont. Um, but most preparations are going to find between 10 and 20 degrees in real clinical practice. Okay, so retention, right, is affected by <clears throat> our total occlusal convergence or taper. So an easy way to understand this is um, if you were to ever pick up some red solo cups, right, sometimes they stick together. Why is it that they stick together? Well, the walls are pretty parallel, so they engage each other, right? There's a minimal path, uh, or there's not as many different ways in which that crown can be separated or differing paths of withdrawal. So thus, they tend to stick together. Whereas if you pick up a stack of party hats, those almost never stick together. And why is that? Because the walls are leaned in, right? There's many directions in which you can pull that top hat off of, okay? So we know that the more parallel you are, the better, the better retention form you're going to have. More parallel walls will also lead to better resistance, right? You're also going to get less tipping force, okay? Because the crown will eventually bump into the wall of the tooth, and then it won't rotate off, right? All right, so we want to keep the tooth as parallel as we can, but we actually don't want it to be like zero degrees. Why don't we want it perfectly parallel? Well, it may be so parallel that you can't even seat it down fully, because remember, at some point, <clears throat> you have to fill that crown with cement, right? So if you seat that crown and there's like zero room there, well, that cement may end up holding your crown up because it doesn't have enough room for that cement to flow out of in order for you to seat that crown fully down. Okay, so there is a level in which a taper, um, you know, you want to be too, too parallel, okay? And you definitely want, don't want to be where you're divergent, where the top part of your prep is wider than the bottom part, okay? You always want your walls to be converging, not diverging, All right? So stay away from zero degree parallelism because you probably are too parallel or you may have an undercut in it. So this is, you know, um, kind of a diagram to show ideal taper, where the top part is just a little bit more narrow than your bottom. So this is a cross section. So between your red and blue line, you should be able to see down and see a little bit of that wall all the way through on all the surfaces. Okay, that means that you have a well tapered restoration. If the two lines meet, what do you think that means? Let's say you can't see the bottom red line. They're either perfectly parallel or you have an undercut where 
this is actually angled this way, and then you have a little bit that's hidden there. Okay? Now, this is an example of a tooth that's probably over tapered. Look at that angle. So when you look straight down your tooth, look at the dis difference between the top of the prep towards the bottom. You're going to see your wall, your axial wall, and it's going to be much wider from this view than from this view. Okay? So as you guys prepare your teeth, take your mirror, position it so you can sight down the long axis of the tooth or the path of placement. And you're going to look at the top of your prep and compare that to the junction of the bottom of your prep, the axial wall to the margin. Right, so this line here, this pink one. And see how wide that separation is. You want to keep that so it's present, but to a minimum. Okay? All right, this is what we know about taper. It's not a linear relationship as you compare it to retention. So when you get to about 30 degree taper, look how much your retention drops off. So if you were to measure retention in terms of megapascals, how much force it requires for you to remove the two pieces together, you can see that as your taper increases, it exponentially decreases the retention of it. Okay. So your taper is not a lint not in a linear relationship with your retentive value. All right, let's get into resistance form, right? So when we talk about resistance form, we also want to pay attention to the height to base ratio of the tooth. That's going to have an effect on describing how easy it is for that crown to be dislodged or rotated off, right? So the taller the tooth you have, is that going to be better for resistance form or worse? better, right? Taller walls prevent the crown from rotating off, okay? So maybe this picture will be a little bit easier to see that. So um, if you look at the top picture, you'll notice that that prep is taller than the bottom, and then you can think of a crown that's sitting on here and pretend we're going to rotate it off of um, the tooth from this point of rotation. So as you rotate the crown off, if it's a short wall, well, this part will bypass this tooth structure and it'll end up being able to roll off. Whereas if you have a taller wall, okay, then eventually that crown is going to hit the tooth right there and it's going to prevent it from rotating off of the tooth. Okay, you guys with me? So taller the wall, the better, right? And then same, how about for the, and I don't have a picture of it here, but let's think in our heads, okay? Let's say we kept the height of the prep the same. So you have two preps, same height. One is narrow, so imagine the base being real narrow, and imagine the second prep, your base is really wide. Which is going to be preferential to our resistance form? All right, who wants to take a stab at that and explain why you chose the answer? Yes? Okay. So the narrower your crown is, the steeper the angle in which that's going to rotate off of, which means it's going to bump into your axial wall much more quickly, thus preventing it from rotating off. Whereas if you have a much wider base, think of the arc that that forms, right? And that's going to be much easier for it to be dislodged, okay? So the, and maybe I'll have another picture there tomorrow if that's not very clear. But the idea is the more narrow your base is, right, assuming you keep the same height, the more re uh, resistance form that has. Okay? So if you were to think about our, let's compare anterior teeth to posterior teeth. Which teeth will naturally have better resistance form? Anterior teeth, because they're taller and a little bit more narrow. Okay? Um, so that plays a role in it. So uh, another thing to think about, though, too, is just the surface area. So a posterior tooth has more surface area than an anterior tooth. So the more surface area, the more that it's in contact, right? So even though we'll say that the back tooth are shorter, they may have more surface area for res retention form compared to an anterior tooth. The anterior tooth has less tooth structure, right? So there's just less volume or surface area of the two pieces touching each other. So anyways, just, there's 
multiple factors that play into retention and resistance form. But generally, your main principles are how tall the wall is, you know, height to base ratio, and taper are two very big um, kind of factors that influence retention and resistance form. All right? Um, so again, you're going to cite down the long axis to determine um, your taper. And this sets us up for this idea of an undercut. So this is probably the most important principle to understand, because this is actually one of the few things in which you would get an automatic fail in a progress exam. So if you have an undercut, um, this idea of an undercut, let me just define it first. Any irregularity in the wall of a prepared tooth that prevents the withdrawal or seating of a wax pattern or casting. So when we talk about the steps in making a crown is to wax up the tooth and eventually take off that wax pattern so that you can invest and cast it, right? So if you can't even take the wax off of the die, how the hell are you going to invest it? You can't, right? So either the wax is going to break, uh, well, that's probably going to happen if you force that wax off, okay? So imagine you have prepared this tooth and you got a little divot. You see that little divot there, right? So let's say we make an impression and pour that into stone. So pretend this is a stone cast, right? Then we're going to add wax to this, right? We dip it in that little wax reservoir so that you have a coping and we start waxing onto it. And we wax up our wax pattern. Are we able to pull this wax pattern off of the die without it breaking? No, right? So if we go back, our impression material is able to capture this because what do we know about our impression material? It's elastic. What does elastic mean from our dental materials class? Good. Yeah, so it's able to return back to its original form, right? So um, PVS, polyvinyl siloxane, is our impression material. That's an elastic material. It's able to go in and capture the detail of that little divot, but as you take it off, it's able to flex over it and then return back to its original form. Okay? What do we know about wax? We categorize that as an inelastic material, meaning that thing's not going to flex. So if that doesn't flex, that's basically locked into it onto that die. Right? We won't be able to remove that from the stone cast. So what if we had something like that in real life? Well, what are our options? So the wax app is not able to be removed without it breaking because it's locked into the undercut. So if you still had the patient in the chair and you notice that, well, one way to correct that is to block it out with some sort of, let's say, composite material. So you'll etch bond and then add composite to that. Okay, so that little thing there represents composite. Okay, and then, then you can make your impression and then that problem is solved. If, let's say, you didn't notice it and it goes to the lab, well, the lab is looking at this stone die and it's got this little divot, well what they can do is add a little bit of acrylic in that area. So we call that a block out. We can block out the undercut. So if we add a little acrylic in that area, well now the subsequent wax up can now be removed without breaking. Just think about what that wax up is going to look like, right? And then we're going to be able to withdraw that wax pattern because the undercut is eliminated, right? So what happens more commonly isn't so much a divot, because those are easy to be identified, right? What's more common, though, is that if we try to make our preparation like too parallel, we have a tendency to put in this undercut by the way that we hold the burr, right? Or if we just lose track of our path of placement, sometimes we'll tip our burr so that the tip is digging into the tooth where the top of it isn't really grinding it. So you're going to introduce... Um, a divergent wall there, okay? So you may end up something with a prep that looks like this. Again, this is still an undercut, except it just kind of extends all the way down into the margin. So, if we were to, this is our proposed path of placement of our crown, we notice a gap at that margin, right? Well, if this happens, the lab technically can still block out that area, right? You can still make an impression that mimics this. So let me take a step back. If you left it alone, you're not able to remove this undercut. 
you're not able to remove this wax pattern because of that undercut. So, but like I was saying, the lab, if you send that to the lab in the stone cast form, they can add a little acrylic that fills in that space there. So that now when you add the wax pattern to it, you're able to withdraw that prosthesis. Okay? What's the disadvantage of that? So if you pay attention to the width of the uh, margin there, notice that our marginal width is decreased, right? So pretend that's a shoulder margin that we wanted. And originally we wanted how wide of a margin there? 1.2. So if we had to block out an undercut in that region, guess how wide your buckle margin is not? It's not 1.2. It's going to be less than that, which then poses an issue, right? What's the issue here? What may happen? Either your porcelain may fracture because it's thin, or it's going to look, or and, it'll look opaque because you have less room for your kind of good looking porcelain, that opaque layer is shining through. Okay? Or even some of the darkness of the metal may be showing through too. Okay? So this is why a you know, even though you can argue that, okay, I can still make a crown that draws, you know, so when we say path of withdrawal, path of placement, those are similar terms. It's still the path that you're going in. Or draw, sometimes you'll hear us just say, oh, you don't, your prep doesn't draw, meaning we can't lift it up, okay? Um, so even though you can make it draw by blocking it out, you've compromised potentially the marginal width. And it requires more lab work from, you know, the more steps you do introduce into here, the less, or the more opportunity for errors to be introduced in this crown fabrication process. All right? So the other thing, too, is not only is your margin less, but imagine when you seat the crown, well, what's going to happen? You're going to have a little gap there. It'll get filled in with cement, but now your cement gap is much larger. So potentially it may influence your retention and resistance form because the crown isn't well adapted and it's not really touching that crown in that area, right? So that's another principle to understand. Okay, so here's another example. Okay, when the undercut is present, it may appear possible to remove the wax pattern by changing the path of withdrawal. So instead of removing the crown straight up and down, well, why can't we just remove it from the side at an angle like that, right? Well, what we have to also consider is the fact that that doesn't exist in a vacuum. You have bring teeth next to it, okay? So if you were to try to remove the crown in that orientation, you would find that, well, the neighboring teeth block it from being able to be removed or placed, however you want to think about it. Right? So really the solution there is to upright and relieve that undercut so that you have the proper path of withdrawal. So that not only does it draw in relation to the opposing or the opposite axial wall, but it's also got to draw so that it doesn't bump into the interproximal context of your neighboring teeth. Okay? So if you prep that like that, then we can lift that up and it'll draw, okay? So undercuts are bad, right? So how do we look for undercuts? Well, again, you're going to sight down the long axis, right? Position your mirror so you can look straight down, and you want to be able to see some part of your wall all the way around. One little trick is you can take your tip of your explorer and then walk it around the junction of the margin in your axial wall, okay? And as you move that explorer around, if that explore tip disappears, what do you think you have there? You have an undercut, right? Because the top of the tooth is blocking your view of that explore tip. That means the width at the bottom is less than the width of the top. And wherever you have that happen, you won't be able to get the wax to withdraw from there. Okay? So undercuts, um, a pretty key concept in... Um, Something to really watch out for, because it's one of those things where we, you know, your prep may look great, but if you got an undercut somewhere, unfortunately, we won't be able to make a crown. You know, at the end of the day, your patient's coming in because you want to give them a crown. 
but if you prepared it um, incorrectly, we can't accomplish it. Whereas some of the other errors may not be ideal, like if you overreduce, let's say, right? All right, it's not ideal that you ground away too, so much tooth structure, but you can still make a crown off of that preparation. Okay.